Andor is back for episode six. And you know what that means. It's time to pull off the big heist. This episode left us on the edge of our seats, delivering an experience so intense I could barely even pause to take notes. Like every episode, this warrants a rewatch, but we know you don't have time for that. I'm Chris Goodmakers, and here are some things you may have missed in Andor's sixth episode. In this episode, Cassian learns that Terramin is a former Imperial Stormtrooper. This is kind of mind-blowing, considering that this is the first Stormtrooper to have defected and joined the Rebellion. It definitely explains how he was able to teach his Rebel Cell how to properly goose-step in a single-file line. Terramin can be seen as the progenitor of Flynn and others from the sequel trilogy, paving the way for future defectors. It does bring into question how the propaganda tactics differ between the Empire and the First Order, as the latter did have twice as many defectors that we've seen so far. Although a bigger question is, why did they stop the cloning process in the first place? What a waste. You can never have too many Tamara Morrisons. As the operation commences, our rebels use the Echo call sign to signal each other. Like many military factions, the Rebellion used several call signs to refer to its different teams. In fact, this show is a prequel to one in particular, a rogue one, if you will. But Echo is an original classic, dating all the way back to the seminal sequel, The Empire Strikes Back. The epic opening action scene on Hoth takes place in, you guessed it, Echo Base. This is just one of several ways this show continues to make the foundation of the Rebel Alliance so engaging, providing us these echoes of the past to see how they reverberate throughout the future. The last three episodes all built towards the raid on the Imperial base, which is stationed within a massive dam. While the architecture provided Faye and Verada a chance to pull a stunt straight out of the opening of Goldeneye, we're wondering if the Aldani base will become the theater for a more exciting action sequence. The base in question is based <laughs> on the German dams used by the Nazis during World War II that were overcome by the Royal Air Force's ingenuity. During Operation Chastis, a squad of pilots strategically bombed three different dams to cut off water and power for German armament factories. The ingenuity used to achieve this plan was pretty clever, developing a bouncing bomb there was a cylindrical canister that was released in midair and bounced across the water to avoid torpedo nets and other impediments. Considering the series isn't one to simply leave a planet behind, it's possible that we may see a rebel bombing run take place, if only to see what bouncing bombs would look like in the Star Wars universe. And hey, this series is all about pointing out the gray morality that's the foundation of the Rebel Alliance. We've talked in previous videos about how Cassian's journey has echoed previous Star Wars protagonists. Much like Luke and Jyn Erso, the Empire took his family from him, forcing him to leave his home and enter a larger world. If we remember our first time meeting him in Rogue One, he shoots an informant dead in order to leave no loose ends as he evades Imperial troops. That's echoed in the latest episode of Andor, where he shoots Skeen while being made an offer to cut the heist hall 50-50 and bail on the Rebellion. Immediately after, Cassian offers Dr. Quadpaw twice his ship's worth in credits before becoming the most wanted man in the galaxy. So if at this point Cassian does resemble any previous Star Wars protagonist the most, it's Han Solo. He can't trust anyone, looks out for number one, secretly has a heart of gold, and canonically shoots first. Now you may be asking, Chris, you handsome devil, Who's Dr. Quadpaw? Dr. Quadpaw was the alien with four hands we saw operating on Nemec. He's got a very similar face to Maz Kanata and Babu Frick from the sequel trilogy, but he has four arms like Ryo from Solo. Actually, Ryo's face does look like everyone I mentioned, but they're all listed as a different species. According to the absolute tome of high information, Wikipedia, Ryo is Ardenian, Babu is Anzelian, and Maz is listed as unknown. Hopefully a tie-in comic will explain where Dr. Quadpaws came from, and if that was his birth name, or if he chose it for himself. His name is a little on the nose, even for a Star Wars character. However, it's still not as good as Elon Sleaze Bagano. This episode marks the second time in the series where Mon Mothma has mentioned the Gorman system. For those of you who don't spend their Friday nights in a caffeinated Wikipedia dive, Gorman was the site of the infamous Gorman Massacre, 
in which troops of the Galactic Empire slaughtered peaceful protesters in mass. The tragedy was a turning point for the Galactic Civil War. It was when Mon Mothma decided to abandon politics and go all in on the rebellion. One of the protesters, Magva Yaro, survived the massacre and ended up joining Saw Gerrera's partisan unit. She even made an appearance in Rogue One, so there's a chance she could show up here. On the subject of cameos, Grand Moff Tarkin was responsible for the massacre, in the expanded universe at least. So the subtle inclusion of this conflict may serve as a meaning of sneaking Tarkin into the series. Hopefully they'll get better CGI this time. We've heard word of rumors circulating through the city. <sighs> right before the climax of the episode, we see the paltry Imperial skeleton crew playing a board game instead of doing their jobs. Ah, I'm just goofing all these poor saps who are about to die. If my boss was making me watch the garage on Canada Day, I'd be doing the same thing. It's not like any game I've seen in the Star Wars universe though. It's not nearly violent enough to be hollow chess, and it's too hexagonal to be Pazak from Knights of the Old Republic. From what little we see, it kind of looks like a free-for-all version of Go, where individual players need to arrange their game pieces around other pieces to establish territory. Given the different clear dots on each side of the hexagonal pieces, it's possible that you're meant to line those up with the others in a significant way. But maybe it's best that we don't know the rules. After all, Star Wars is meant to be appropriate for children, and we shouldn't let it teach them how to gamble. They've got video games for that. The most surprising thing about this episode isn't Skeen's betrayal, but how fast the news of the robbery spread on the galactic infoweb, or whatever weird thing they call the news, meaning the Empire couldn't control the news. Or rather, maybe they didn't care to. In both canon and expanded universe material, the Emperor expressed that he didn't fear the Rebellion. He believed they would have to commit dark acts in order to achieve their means, which would further strengthen the dark side, ultimately tightening the Sith's grip on the galaxy. And it's hard to disagree with that, as the episode ends with most of the Rebels dead and Andor flying off on his own. While I doubt we will see Ian McDermott reprise his legendary role within the confines of Andor, the show may be subtly hinting that the Rebellion has no chance of succeeding until the light of the Jedi begins to shine once again. Remember when we pointed out that the Rebels were carrying around AK-47s? We thought for sure they were some crude, utterly uncivilized weaponry that would highlight how the Rebel Alliance is hopefully outmatched in terms of weaponry. But in this episode, we see that they're in fact blasters and that the AK-47 was just the prop they chose. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a funny aesthetic detail. Although the guns still have bullets in them, but they fire lasers. Do the bullets have lasers in them? Andor continues the trend of visiting familiar Star Wars locations at unfamiliar times. And this episode takes us to the Senate building, one of the most famous and infamous locations introduced in the prequel trilogy. At the episode's end, we see Mon Mothma speaking out against the injustices plaguing the Gorman, but her words fall on deaf ears. It's a shame considering, unlike the senators in Phantom Menace, her dialogue is actually intelligible. Although she's lucky that there aren't any ears at all, most of the seats have been abandoned. Either nobody felt like showing up for this debate, or fewer and fewer systems under Imperial rule even have delegates. Or maybe they just don't like the chairs in the new pods. And the ones Yoda and Palpatine threw at each other were made of irreplaceable vintage Gundark leather. I feel like we've talked about rhyming moments in Star Wars so often that we could do a 17 hour compilation of it. But we do it for a reason. And that's because it's awesome. So far the series has been clearly divided into three episode arcs much like the Star Wars trilogies themselves. Episodes 1 to 3 introduced us to Cassian and thrust him into his larger journey, with episodes 4 to 6 joining the Rebellion and ultimately leaving, as far as we know. Both arcs featured a similar pace to the escalation of the action. Both had side characters die in their third episode, and both climaxes featured Cassian escaping the planet he's been on in a ship he hasn't been in before. Each ascent is a crescendo, that translates into the next phase of Andor's life. If this trend continues, this should happen two more times by the time the show is over. So come back for this video in six weeks to tell us if we were wrong. And with that, we're halfway done through Andor. And 
I'm sad now. Andor returns next week. And so do I. We've clearly hit the turning point of this season, and it's unclear where things will go. But in the best kind of way. There were lots of twists this episode, but I want to put a little wrinkle in that shocking final moment. When Skeen approaches Andor about stealing the credits and skipping out on the cause, was he sincere? Or was he actually testing Andor? Would Skeen have shot Andor if he said yes? I guess we'll never know. But too bad for Skeen. Andor wasn't ready to play that game.